Welcome to the White and Blue Podcast. I'm Doug Goodno, and my co-host is Colleen McGinnis. We are here to tell the interesting stories of Hillsdale College alumni, or more accurately, help them share their own stories. Here's a little bit about today's guest. Chester Marco, a Polish immigrant who was recruited as a place kicker by former Hillsdale College head football coach Frank Muddy Waters, made a splash as a soccer-style rookie kicker with the Green Bay Packers in 1972. He was the National Football League in scoring and earned the Rookie of the Year honors. He led the league in scoring again in 1974 and was a two-time All-Pro kicker. However, after his career ended, he has had a long battle with drug and alcohol addiction. Today, he remains sober and works as a drug and alcohol abuse counselor in the Upper Peninsula. Chester, thank you for joining us today. Well, it's my privilege and pleasure being at Hillsdale, first time in 40 years. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. We're glad to have you back, and hopefully you've had a, a good visit so far. I did. Uh, it grew quite a bit. <laughs> Several new buildings or some buildings that were there, like Galloway Hall. They changed a little bit, but they're still there. And so it's... Uh, Really, I've been really at peace and happy because just being in, in Hillsdale campus and see the clock still there. That's that's my favorite. Yeah, Is he it wanted on to time? See, he wanted to see Central Hall. That was one oh, of the first nice. things yeah. he wanted to check out. Well, so, I'm excited you're here because I've been hearing about you for many years, about 25 years at least well, of my Hillsdale experience. It. So it's exciting to meet you. But. Thank you. So Chester, tell us about your path to Hillsdale and more importantly, your relationship with Muddy Waters. Yes, uh, when I first came to Hillsdale, I didn't even know there was a Hillsdale College. I didn't know where it was. But John Rowan, one of my physical education teachers, and he was a football coach as well, asked me, he says, would you like to go to Hillsdale, because he played basketball here, and have a tryout? I said, fine. So we had a graduation night before, and we went to Port Huron, Michigan, in in uh, YMCA, and I got home at 6 a.m., and John picked me up at 7 a.m. Wow. Take me to Hillsdale. I remember young, my young, my, uh, one of my brothers, Mark, he came along. So we went, and I had a chance to meet Muddy and... Uh, it was really, really special. We had a conversation in his office, just chatted. He asked several questions, and, and I felt real comfortable, really at peace with him, like immediately, if not sooner, because uh, I don't warm up to people real fast, except when there is some sense of trust. And so then we went on the field, and I did what I was asked to do, and lo and behold, by the time I left Hillsdale, I, I had a scholarship to come to Hillsdale. So that's how my uh, that's how my beginning of Hillsdale College is was. And and it was awesome. Frank Muddy Waters became big father figure in my life. He helped me through some real difficult emotional situations at times because I really didn't have a mentor. You know, I came from Poland in 1965. My father took his life in 64. And I was 15 and a half when we came here in April 65. That October, I turned 16. Hmm. So, And I never saw a football game. I couldn't speak to English language. My first word, I'm not going to say what I learned from my grandpa, because <laughs> he was listening to President talking, and he stood up and said his word, and that's the first word I remember. <laughs> I went to high school and asked somebody what that means. Uh -oh. They start laughing. I mean... One of the kids, yeah. not to the teacher. Yeah. So, but but that's okay, and and you know that's what I learned, and that's how it was. So Frank Buddy Waters was part of my life for much longer than Hillsdale College. You know, when uh, I had a whole bunch of issues and attempted suicide, he called the NFL and set up non-football injured disability because that was hurting and he had negotiated your first nfl contract too right yes he did him <laughs> and another i can't remember his name but but muddy muddy knew him he was a big investor from out east and and so he helped me he helped me made a couple investments were real lucrative and good you know so i appreciated that and uh you know muddy meant so well to his players he was 
helpful beyond any expectations I would have from any coach. So it, it, it was really awesome that I came to Hillsdale because Michigan State, was talking to me, and El Doro, one of their coaches, he would send me little notes after my high school football games and this and that, And but then they stopped. And since I had that situation when I came to Hillsdale, I knew that's where I belonged, so it was really nice. I went, to, uh, I went from Poland, different atmosphere, different culture, slow, people were just cared about people. I didn't know anything about being prejudiced. I I had no clue. I thought there was only Catholic churches because I didn't see one, you know. And so it was different. So I but I came to Imlay City, a farming community 60 miles north of Detroit. And that's all I knew. I was working on a farm or gas stations and uh, playing sports and and my maker and my God gave me a special ability that allowed me to come to school, college. Otherwise, there's no, I don't know, there's no way we would be able to, you know. And uh, my mom was single, and, and she never dated another man, and she's 94, and we have a real good relationship, and she still walks mile every day at least, and, and so it's pretty awesome. So Muddy, yeah, Muddy made an impact on me like no one, no other man. And he was helpful for many years thereafter. I remember when I was in a hospital in Lansing, he would come into the hospital and visit and sit on the edge of my bed and ask me all these questions in the NFL. So next thing I know, all this stuff was resolved. Wow. So he did, he did special things in my life and, and for other players too. So that was really, really, he really cared. He loved his players, you know, so that was awesome. How how old were you when you uh, immigrated here from Poland? I was 15 and a half. Okay. We came here April 16th, 1965, and that October 24th, I turned 16. Wow. So it was different. Walking, going mm-hmm. to schools, not knowing the English language, couldn't communicate with anybody. Thank God my cousin Teresa, she, was, she came to the United States with her mom and dad, and they... Uh, she knew some Polish, so I was just following her to class. And and she would explain some. And a couple of teachers really were powerful in my life, too, in Imlay City. Because one hour a week, I felt like I was in first grade, but I needed to be there to learn things. Because my peers would go out to the chalkboard. Of course, we had chalkboards those days. And they would write a word. And then they would act out on what the word, and I had to say in Polish to my cousin Teresa if I understand what that meant. So that was pretty cool. And then next week, or next class, he would give me a test. I learned from radio mostly. So you get to Hillsdale, you're playing football, and that's, you kind of made an impact almost immediately. You know, you come in, you're kicking a college record at the time, 62-yard field goal. You're making extra points. You're kicking all kinds of field goals. You're punting at an average that really nobody's seen before, and people start to take note. Kind of talk about your playing experience and what maybe your highlight of your Hillsdale career was. Yeah, there were several highlights. You know, obviously that field goal, I didn't even realize what I did. <laughs> I know I kicked the field goal and it was long. I had no clue how it was, and I remember going forward during cartwheel on the on a field, and, and that, was, uh, that was about it that I ever did after anything that I did that was special. I was always told, if you get in the end zone, act like you've been there before. So, you know, so I, I, I was different. I, I was not the rah-rah kind of guy. I did because what I did, because I'm supposed to do that. And I was given the tremendous physical gift from God, and that's how it was to me. I didn't need to show off to anybody yeah because i knew that the only reason i was able to come to college and get educated and do this this and that because i had a ability god-given talent that all i had to do is hone it and i would do it and and 
So everybody in my family was like that. But my family was very, very excited, you know, to watch it on TV. When I, we played in Pontiac, well, first of all, in Tiger Stadium or in Pontiac. It was nice after the game because I saw several of my friends and my family members. And, and yeah, so, this is when you get drafted to the NFL by the Green mm-hmm. Bay Packers, your second round draft pick. Right. Which at the time, for a kicker to be drafted in the second round is almost unheard of. So tell me about, you know, like I said, that process where you're a star at Hillsdale and, you know, you've got people telling you, you're going to play in the NFL. What what was going through your mind during that They period? were telling me that in high school. Some of my friends, I was working at gas station, big truck stops. So there was a lot of traffic and some old timers used to come in there and just chat. And he said, "You're gonna play in the NFL. You're gonna you're gonna go to college. You're gonna be you're gonna be a superstar someday." I said, "Okay, <laughs> let's see what happens." And uh, so people predicted that, and I was grateful that I had that chance because I wanted to be able to help my family. You know, there was in my heart that was number one, and you know, money those days was very little. I had. 1972, when I was drafted by the Packers, I had a $20,000 bonus, and my salary first year was 18000 <laughs> You know, and, and, but I do it again. Minimum pay those days was 13500 and some of my friends would make that. So my experience was incredible. Last place I ever wanted to play was in Green Bay because when I was at Hillsdale, we played. St. Norbert's College, which is 10 miles from Green Bay, and it was the coldest game I've ever performed in. And it was so cold the day before, Muddy wouldn't let us practice because he was afraid we'd get a frostbite. So, yeah, and, and I ended up in Green Bay, and I knew I was going to end up in Dallas because they talked to me 20 minutes before. Out of the blue, I get the phone rings, and, and uh, it's Green Bay. I was somewhat shocked but i was happy because i got to be i was drafted by by the national football league team and that's a privilege it was really privilege in my life and everybody was happy and but that's how it was i was at home there was no such thing on tv blah 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 that was that was my next question so the draft was basically at home you were sitting at home with your family I assume. Yeah. yeah. And then you've received a phone call. Don Dahl, he was a defensive back coach. He called me. Hey, we drafted you by the Green Bay Packers. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, thank you. He said, we'll be in touch. That was my conversation. <laughs> and so how did, how, wh- what did you, what were the emotions running through your mind then? Your oh, family? I was excited. I was happy. You know, I've never been the rah-rah kind of person, mm-hmm. but I was excited. I was happy. I very seldom in my life for a long time showed my emotions and feelings and great deal had to do with my father's suicide Mm -hmm. because when he took his life when I was 14 I didn't shed a tear till I was 36 wow so you know I ran a blocked field goal for a touchdown and a guy in the locker room is interviewing me said geez you don't even seem like you're excited and I was in I'm in I was always internalizing stuff but, you know, that's how it was. And that's who I was. And, and you know, sometimes that's not good. Sometimes it's really good because if I don't say anything, nobody can spec- speculate, right? And a couple of times I said some things in private with a couple of my friends from TV station, newspaper. Then they put on the crap in, in, in front of the people that angered me. Mm. So I had a choice, either continue to be stupid and tell them whatever or just talk about issues like that with my friends and my family so yeah rookie year was really really special and and you know hillsdale college played uh st norbert's my rookie year on saturday so i went there uh and i kicked a field goal against the bears to end the game you know (laughs) we won and 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 i drove with a couple guys from the radio station and, and uh, Tony, I think it was. and Tony Flynn? Yeah, Tony Flynn and Pat. And and so we drove after the game all the way to Hillsdale. And next day, I, I see people, saw my girlfriend, and then I flew out on Monday. So mm-hmm. 
You know, so there was a lot of special moments. But my biggest moment, I think it was, my most special moment my rookie year, there was two of them. One playing my first Monday night game against the Lions in Tiger Stadium because I love Tiger Stadium because I went to a lot of Tiger games in 68 when they won a World Series. And so it was special. And the weather wasn't really nice, and it was pretty windy, but that stadium had three decks. So it was very comfortable. And, you know, with 10 seconds, I kicked a winning kick, and we won by one point. So that was really special, and my family was there. So first Monday night. Hmm. And then uh, we played Minnesota Vikings, 13th game of the season because we had 14 games. And if we won, we would have, uh, that means we won the Central Division at that time. And we went to Minnesota and sacked Fred Tarkenton five times. Usually he wasn't sacked five times in 10 games. But we did, and we beat him very handily. And that was a colder game than I played against St. Orbers. That was very wicked. And uh, I've tried a field goal into the wind from 35 yards. It was eight, nine-yard short, and I kicked it really well. The wind was blowing so hard. But I did end up kicking a lot of field goals, and... I remember kicking it with the wind, and when I kicked it, I put my head down and said unspeakable words right now. <laughs> down, and I'm down looking, and I look up, and it's like somebody's blowing the ball there. It was at least five yards wide. Ended up right through the middle of the hole. <laughs> so because of the wind. So you got to remember, those days the stadiums were poor at best. Mm-hmm. Baseball fields. Grass and outfield was that long. It'd be like playing golf in rough the whole time. So I loved AstroTurfs. So, so I'm going to go off script here. It's just you know, hopefully Doug uh, will understand. But uh, I'm very curious after hearing you talk a little bit more and finding out more about you. But what happened in your life? You know, how did you become such a great kicker? How did you learn how to be a ki- how to be a NFL place kicker from? Growing up in Poland and then coming here. Playing soccer. Okay. So Simple you played soccer. That. Okay. And it started in the gym class. We were supposed to be outside, but it was raining and blah, blah, blah. We played soccer with a volleyball. Thank God it was a volleyball. So there was a penalty kick. And John Rowe, on the, who was responsible for me to come to Hillsdale. And was John a, was a Hillsdale right. grad, 1965. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and she was a goalie. So... It's in the gym, and we had a goal, and there was three, four feet behind him was a wall. So I had a penalty kick, and I just I whack, whacked that thing as hard as I could. <laughs> it went so fast by him, right by his head, and he turned around, and the ball hits him in the face, knocks him down. I mean, not out. Poor guy was wearing cotton in his nose, nose bleeding. I was scared. I didn't know what to say. But that's how my career started because – he brought me these bag of these balls that I never saw. They, to me, they looked like rugby ball. And he puts them on the floor in the gym, says, Kick the, hit the, see if you can hit the wall. Well, I hit the ceiling halfway to the gym. So, the, so then they took me outside. I was kick, kicking off 70 yards. And, and, you know, 15 years old, that was no big deal hmm. for me and my wow. friends. And I was kicking 60-yard field goals and stuff. The way they were talking and everything, said, man, they treat me like I'm second coming or something, and I don't <laughs> understand why. And this is in high school. In high when school, you got yeah, I was 15. The US. Yeah, yeah and, and my language was poor at best, English mm-hmm. language, because this was in September, and we came in April, and the okay. whole summer, obviously, I worked on a farm, so I didn't have anybody try to educate me except the radio. And, and so then they asked me to go get a physical through my cousin, because they want me to play football. I told them, so I'll never play this barbaric sport. <laughs> <laughs> but after a couple of days, I agreed and got my physical, and that's how my career started, you know? So not only, I'll, I'll do a follow-up here, you know, you obviously were a great kicker through soccer, and you had that gift, but there's a difference between, there's a lot of people that can kick a ball a long way, but to do it in a game situation, an NFL situation, why do you think you were so good compared to a lot of other guys who had strong legs? Because I didn't think others existed. <laughs> I shot people off. I can shut them right out. 
People can say whatever they say. I care less. The more they say, the better I do. I had this drive and this confidence. My confidence told me I can't miss. I don't care. Hmm. I, even when I lined up today, we were at the at the stadium, right? We were 60-some yards away, and to me, that looked pretty close. And and obviously, I can't do that anymore because my leg probably go further than... Yeah, I asked <laughs> I asked you. You know, we could, we could have seen, but... Did yeah. you kick out? Did you... Did you try to kick out? Heck oh. No. <laughs> no. Mm. We want to keep him standing Healthy. up through his visit here. They don't want emergency room entrance by me. Yeah. No. I, I, and I know my limits. I can punt yet because I punt with kids, you know, 30, 40 yards and just barely touching the ball. Or for young kids, I take a soccer ball and I kick it way up and they're four years old. They think it's going to the sky, right? <laughs> You know, that's the kind of stuff. But other than that, I have nothing to prove. I, I did everything I needed to when I needed to. And, and uh, yeah, it, it, this uh, the beginning in Imlay City High School and Hillsdale College and Green Bay and Poland, it's all small environment. And I was blessed with that. I'm not so sure being so naive and that going to play like in New York or Los Angeles or Dallas and stuff would have been, I was just naive. Mm -hmm. uh, I, in my high school career, I never see any of my teammates drink. I never see any of my teammates smoke cigarettes and I never saw marijuana until I came to college. Wow. And I didn't know what pain pills were. I thought pain pills were Bayer aspirin. I was 27. When I was well, they should be. That. So that was nice. You know, I was not involved in anything. I didn't have anything to veer off on or depend on. Mm. And But the injuries happened, right? Mm -hmm. And it started. I took two in Milwaukee on the way to Green Bay, drank a beer, and tapped my buddy on the shoulder 20 minutes later. I said, David, I want to feel like this all my life. Mm. So I do understand when people talk about they found magic to learn how to not have to deal with life, but magic ends up to be hell. So, you know, those kind of things. So I, I was a pretty naive guy, pretty naive. Late bloomer and everything. I start, I smoked cigarettes for a long time, but I didn't start till I was 22. So it doesn't make any sense by then, right? <laughs> but I tried. Okay, well, I think we're gonna take a little break here and we'll be right back with the White and Blue Podcast. Great books, great people, and great ideas. Knowledge of these things is critical to becoming a well-educated human being. That's why I'd like to tell you about an easy and enjoyable way for you to listen and learn whenever and wherever you want. And that's through the Hillsdale Dialogues. If you haven't heard about the Dialogues, once a week, Hillsdale College President Larry Arn joins radio veteran Hugh Hewitt to discuss topics of enduring relevance, from time to time, they also talk about current events, but always with an eye toward more fundamental truths. And they want you to listen in, to join a conversation like no other. The Hillsdale Dialogues are posted every Friday on podcast.hillsdale.edu. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. <laughs> Now it's time for the Hillsdale History Minute, where we bring a slice of Hillsdale College history to the White and Blue podcast. For today's minute, we focus on Hillsdale's NFL legacy. Hillsdale has seven former student athletes who have played in the NFL. Chester Markle and former offensive lineman Howard Mudd both had all pro careers in the 1960s and the 1970s for the Packers and San Francisco 49ers, respectively. Mudd was also a standout offensive line coach in the NFL for nearly four decades, helping the Indianapolis Colts win a Super Bowl in 2009. Bruce McLenna had a brief career as a running back for the Detroit Lions in the 1960s before he was killed in an automobile accident. In the 1970s, Nate Johnson had a short stint as a kick returner for the Pittsburgh Steelers. More recently, Jared Valdier had an 11-year career as an offensive lineman for five different teams. He last played in 2020. Andre Holmes was a wide receiver for seven seasons with various teams, retiring in 2018, 
while linebacker Zach Van Valkenburg completed his first season with the Los Angeles Rams in 2023. Okay, we're back with the White and Blue Podcast, and today's guest is Charger football legend and NFL superstar kicker, Chester Markle. Chester, we talked a little bit about your Hillsdale career, your early career with the Packers. Tell us about, you know, basically the end of your NFL career, and actually you came back to Hillsdale after your career to complete your degree. Yes, and you know, everything was fine and dandy my third year again, I all pro, pro bowl, you know, and, and all these accolades. And I was really proud of that. And, and uh, accomplishment was great. And 1975, uh, I tore my quad muscle, first game of the season in Milwaukee. And I was on a kickoff. I just, got, I just kicked a field goal on a kickoff, and it sounded like I would take a stick and break it on my over my uh, thigh muscle, right? Like a lot of times people do that. And it was a lot of pain. It was an incredible pain. And so after the game, I was in a lot of pain, so they gave me these two pills. I didn't know what they were for pain. I thought they were Bayer aspirin, you know, I didn't know. They gave me two Tylenol number three and, and I didn't know what I was taking and I didn't know that that was an opiate that people can get addicted to. Some people can take it and be done with. Some people can drink and be done with. But some people start and they find new magic. I found magic in those pain pills in the beginning because I remember telling my buddy David Beverly in a bus on the way back, you know, I drank a beer and took two pills. And 20 minutes later, I got that euphoria. And I said, David, I want to feel like this all my life. You know, I continued to take two to four a day, which a lot less than was prescribed. But then after the season, I stopped taking them until I start working out later on. But uh, I was itchy. I was crabby. I was all this and all that. And today, I know there were opiate withdrawals from minimum intake, but it was a long time, September, October, November, and December. So still, every day, there is a substance that, I didn't know I was dependent on was part of my life. And then when I took that away from the body, uh, I didn't know what was happening. But there were withdrawals and I got through them and I was fine. Everything was fine and dandy. And then next year I started doing it again and I came back to play. But I wasn't right. My uh, In my growing, there was calcium deposit. It looked like crab legs in there, you know, and I was in a lot of pain all the time. So before the game, I would take a couple pills and sometimes in halftime, a couple pills, but that was pretty much it. But that changed my life in the long run. That beginning, that was the beginning of the end in my life. As time went on, four, two, three, four a day, we became 10 a day and blah, 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 whatever. And I found myself lethargic at some times, not excited. I found myself tired after a couple of hours and so I didn't know that I needed more in order to get back and, you know, and that was during the games. Before the before the game, I take a couple by the halftime, an hour and a half later, it's a big difference. And, and then after the game, and, and uh, so I start calling some of my friends who were dentists and I start lying. I told them this, and of course they gave me pills. I went to the dentist because my teeth were always bad. And and they fixed them and this and that. And so I had avenue to pills. And people weren't aware of opiate addiction like, of course, we are right now. And, and so it became more and more and more. And then I would take them in off season. Once in a while, I would go to my dentist, gave me 20 pills, and... I would have that nice euphoria, like life was really cool. But yet, yet at the same time, I st- start feeling concerned. But feeling concerned and doing something about it is different. And 1980 ended up to be my last NFL season, not by choice. Week before the first game, I was at this place, and this person said... Uh, 
Why don't you try cocaine? I didn't know what cocaine was. And she said, it only costs you $100 a gram. You got money. I says, well, let's try it. And man, oh man, it was like 4th of July fireworks. Once again, I found new magic. You know, and, and that took me from a penthouse to a crap house in no time. I was, I scored a touchdown on blocked field goal against the Bears, first game of the year, overtime. How bad it could it get, right? The perfect ending. The Marco Miracle, they call it. Right. It's out and, on, on YouTube all over if you want right. to see it. Right, and it was, all, it was great. I was happy. I went, we went to International House of Pancake with kids, one kid at that time, and, and my ex, and, and International House of Pancakes on a billboard, it says Chester Markle for president. <laughs> mm. You know, we didn't have the phones to take pictures, but somehow we got a picture. I don't know where it is, but, mm. but you know, I mean, it was special, right? I, I go inside of the Packers Stadium, there's a sign, Chester Markle, the Polish Messiah, 21 years old. Mm. But it was just saying, you know, and, and, and I didn't understand why people a lot of people wanted to be my friends and be part of my life that probably in the long run didn't give a darn what i did what i didn't do so and i didn't know mm -hmm. i was swallowed by fame right obviously it's, oh you're a celebrity you're famous i didn't even understand what celebrity was but i know to other people it was special right mm -hmm. they want to hang with me they want but whatever it doesn't really matter and and you know the addiction became more difficult to deal with and i started doing that cocaine maybe once or twice a day within a week i was buying quarter ounces and i snorted it before the game and at halftime not a lot that wasn't stupid high but i was not just normally cognitive like the brain is without that stuff so, and, and that turned out to be poor at best. And, and then I got released. I went to my first treatment in Green Bay, and then I got picked up by the Houston Oilers, and I played my first game in Green Bay against Green Bay, walking from the opposite side with different uniform, number mm -hmm. five, not number 13. I felt pitiful. I was happy that my career could go on but i was so sad i wanted to be a packer for life and you know but they gave me a really good opportunity so so you mentioned that you almost ended your life why do you think you did not what saved you at that time i don't know i really don't know i was screwed up in the head so mm -hmm. Must have been that certain feeling that I just didn't want my kids to grow up without a father like I did. Mm -hmm. You know, because later on, I certainly attempted suicide and I died. Yeah. But well, you mentioned that your faith has played a role in your in your book. Correct. You mentioned that your faith has played a, an important role in your recovery. Right. Um, yeah. Do you think that was part I of it? I think that was I mean, uh, my maker's interference. Mm hmm because according to what I see now from that moment, I would have been useless sitting in prison. Mm -hmm. But being able to experience my life the way I did allows me to carry the message for people who are hopeless, feel helpless. And, are, and so when they read that, because I felt hopeless and helpless, in a book I wrote some places, I felt lower than the oil's crap in the bottom of the ocean. That was my self-worth. was none. See, I went truly from a penthouse to a crap house mm -hmm. in no time. My God gave me athletic ability that allowed me to survive since I was a child. Fastest on the block, fastest in school. Uh, second in class B in states and long jump. And I was... Whatever I touched, I did really well. But obviously, kicking field goals and doing what I, what I did with, for the Packers was very special. So my identity was performance. 
always the best edible. Oh, Chester Marco, mm-hmm. people in church tap me by and <laughs> can I have your autograph? I said, please at least wait till the preacher start talk, stops talking. <laughs> so all that. So I was in forefront, a lot of Etta boys, right? And then all of a sudden my career was over because of that situation. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I didn't know who I was. I had no clue. Everything that I ever was, I wasn't. So my addiction accelerated and then some, mm-hmm. living in my car and just well, just not taking care of myself. You talked about a lot of your friends kind of left you once your playing career was over. Correct. But one who didn't was uh, Hillsdale Athletic Director Jack McAvoy. So tell us about that phone call you got and how you're able to come back to Hillsdale and get your degree, which ultimately helped you where you're, where you're at right now as an addiction counselor. Right. And, and Jack called me to come to visit. We didn't have a long conversation over the phone, but I always trusted him. I liked him. So I came and he told me, he says, Chester, if I find out what classes you need to graduate, well, you'll come back to school and we'll take care of it. So, I needed 14 hours plus three or 13 hours plus four kinesiology in the summertime. So I said, fine. So we set up a job at the youth home and and I was doing that and going to class and I graduated. (laughs) So it was really special. And I was thinking, I said, heck, I'm never going to use this as in my life for, for a degree, diploma is not going to make any difference in my life. But it did. But it did. It took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Several decades after that. Yeah, so, you know, because I, I went through a graduation procession, and I remember the president of Hillsdale College at then gave it to me and said some really nice words, how proud, how help, grateful he is that he can present that to me and blah, blah, blah. Obviously, on the inside, there was no diploma. I don't have a diploma to this year, this day from Hillsdale College. But someday, maybe I will. So We can work on that. Yeah. That's, I'm that, making a note. That's good. Because, uh, yeah, that would be fun to have one in my office. You know, I got all these other uh, therapist certificates and blah, blah, blah. And, and so it's pretty cool. So I, I graduated and... Uh, I went, after that, I went to my first treatment in Lansing. That's where I got a job at Star Commonwealth School for Boys in Albion. I worked there for quite some time, and I love it. I loved working with trouble kids. Because to me, they're just kids who do bad things. And a lot of them didn't stand a chance. There's a reason for from it. At home, right? Yeah. What's your best advice to those dealing with addiction? Well, to get help. To really get special help and not saying day or week or three, four weeks into a therapist or treatment if they had to go in, oh, it's not working for me. But this is a lifetime proposition. This is not a knock on mm-hmm. a door, come in, oh, you're such a great guy, such a great gal, and then you leave. It doesn't work that way because this is the addiction of alcohol and or other drugs it's a lifetime proposition and it's not a hiccup. It's not like I break my arm, fix it, I'm fine. This is never fixed. Every drug addict and alcoholic, the, the number one dream in their life, I just want to do it one more time. You know, I worked with heroin addicts, two and a half percent sober up, alcoholics, 10% sober up. And drug addicts have a more difficult time with their life in general because in the beginning all these drug addicts is a drug addict but people are great people are good but did a lot of bad things Mm -hmm. and so the attitude overall even in the in in a doctor's in a in a physical i mean people with mds always said to one of my friends who was running a treatment that i worked with in green bay he says you work with those people you know, she was professional, and, and he, he, this one guy had, was top man in one of the departments. So that's the kind of, if I get that kind of attitude from a physician, the overall attitude towards people like that is not good. 
I understand why people get frustrated because they're, they're they're angry as heck of being robbed, of being manipulated. Uh, kids steal everything from the family. I was signing my book in Milwaukee, and afterwards, this guy came to me. He cried. He explained that his son was an opiate addict. He went out of the country for business. He came back. All the furniture, refrigerator, everything was gone, sold. And he'd done that a few times to him. I says, well, why don't you buy some more and let him steal again? I just, he says, there's nothing to steal. He took everything. He took, he says, coin collection. It's probably worth close to a million dollars. He stole all my precious coins and everything. So now how in the heck normal person is going to think He's a sick person who does bad things. They're going to think, put that son of a gun away for life, mm-hmm. right? But father never pressed charges, so the kid continued to be unable to behave the way he wanted to because my daddy's going to bail me out all the time, not some of the time. So attitudes. But, but yeah, it, it's continued. The key to recovery from treatment is to continue to doing what they leave treatment because that's when rubber meets the road. Treatments are not very long anymore. They're 30 days, most of them. After 30 days for an alcoholic, the big difference between coming in and walking out is they they don't shake as much. But it's hard to deal with everything. So aftercare is really important. Years ago, when I went to treatment to Phoenix House, I say 10 months. Transition house and regular treatment. So continuous support and and the planting a seed. My responsibility is to plant a seed in somebody's heart, to love them, to care for them, to be honest, to educate them. And I always tell them, my dream for you is that from this treatment, you go on a different road that you came in from. Because if you go back up on the same road, chances of recovery are non-existent. Slim and none and slim left down, I used mm-hmm. to tell them, you know. And it's a fact. It's, it's, a, it's a situation that is, uh, very desirable in my heart because I want to carry the message. Because if I can get through all the stuff that I went through, there's hope. You know, granted, and when I was 36 years old, 1986, I attempted suicide and I died. And, uh, you know, I drank a whole bunch of battery acid, mixed it with rat poison. By miracle, most people, when they meet me and talk to me, they wouldn't even think that. But, it was that. So that, that was a long struggle to come back emotionally. and, and uh, That sounds like the real Markle miracle. That is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, people really want to read or learn about your entire story. They should really pick up your book, Alive and Kicking, which is out there on Amazon and a few other sellers. It was a really riveting read, and you were very, very to the point and open like you are with us today. So the good news is hopefully you've got a good end to your story. You know, you're living up in the Upper Peninsula, working, still working at uh, almost 75 years old as an addiction counselor. Tell me about your life right now. It's good. <laughs> life is good every day, and that's all I have, right? That one day at a time or one game at a time, I used to think that mm-hmm. something is so stupid and silly, but that's a fact. You know, I have a daily reprieve, contingents on my spiritual wellness or lack thereof. So I work in a Phoenix house in Calumet, a land of 300 plus inches of snow every year. Other than last year, we had a mild winter, probably a couple hundred, but still a lot more than, than here. And, and uh, I go to my conferences. I just came back from conference in Menominee, Wisconsin, by, Minis- by Minneapolis. And it's really nice because I have friends that come from Hawaii. There used to be three women come from India. So we have counselors from all over the United States. And, you know, I, I need to keep up with the Joneses and my certification as well. So I take, and it's a four day deal. So it's special. And, uh, you know, I do group therapies. I no longer work in a, in a, in a hospital setting clinic that I see patients every day. And, uh, I do pretty much group therapies, fun stuff. I take guys swimming. I take him to outside recovery, 12-step meetings, whether it's NAAA, 
and uh, take him shopping to Walmart. Hey, uh, it's just not possible to change in a week. I can, you know, I can talk to talk and do all that stuff, but let's see what happens when you got to walk to talk. That's really, really important. And I have many friends in recovery. I have many friends who had 20 years and are no longer here because they decided they could drink or drug again. 40 years, 10 years, four days, whatever, right? I've been to plenty of treatment, so I know that sobering up is really easy. Staying sober, it's the hardest thing a person is going to do, by far. Because it's a disease that tells people they don't have one. And mm. just one more time. Mm. And that one more time might end a life. And, and especially people that I worked with, heroin addicts and meth addicts, in the clinics, they use IV drugs. And the way uh, fentanyl is available now, it kills a lot of people, lots. There, there are kids who die dying from smoking weed because it's mixed with fentanyl. 14, a couple 14 year old kids, girls from Milwaukee. That was a few years ago, but it's more and more and more. About 120 people, 120,000 people die a year just from overdosing. And if Narcan was not available, we would have three times that because people can Narcan someone and, and bring them back to life. Unfortunately, a drug addict is madder than a hornet when a Narcan is used because eliminates the drug in the system and, and, and it's uncomfortable for them so they want to do more. And I've seen people, somebody check out and they give them Narcan and the next person who's using, man, this is good stuff, let me have some. But that's the kind of attitude, you know, a normal person mm -hmm. would think, God, that's insane. Like I used to, right? Well, we're glad yeah. you're alive and kicking. We're glad you're back at Hillsdale. and uh, Thank you. Thank you for taking the time with us today. Well, thank you. It was really a privilege to be part of your life. Yeah, I, I appreciate your candidness and sharing your story because I think, you know, being being real with people, we all have struggles in different ways and some manifest themselves more difficultly than others, but we all have it, you know. So being yeah. real with people, it's it's relatable and, and helpful, I think. And I just want to ask one more question, even though Doug just tried to wrap it up. But <laughs> I know you said you're not a rah-rah guy. You mentioned that a couple times, Correct. which I like about you. I'm not a rah-rah girl, but can you share what Hillsdale College means to you? Wow, it means a lot. I dream about Hillsdale College a lot. You know, I get soft-hearted when I talk about Hillsdale. Muddy especially. Yeah. One of the people who saved me. Mm. Jack, Ekavoy, and Muddy, and the whole camp was walking around today it was just like a privilege a dream come true that's wonderful we're very happy to have you on campus thank you welcome back yep. for colleen mcginnis this is doug goodno thanking you for joining us on the white and blue podcast and may that spirit long remain